911, take your emergency. Espanol, estoy. Hello? Espanol. Sí. Estoy enfermo y ahorita ya caí aquí y no me puedo ni levantar. No ¿Tienen estaba... agua y comida? No, no, no. no no, no tenemos nada de agua. Señor, ayúdenos, por favor. Sí, no, no se mortifiquen, no se mortifiquen. Tenemos tres días, está perdido y no hemos tomado agua. ¿Desde cuándo tres días? Tenemos que hacer tres días, vamos. I live it every day. For the last 16 years, every day I'm reminded of dead Mexicans and dead Central Americans who died in Southern Arizona, because that's my job. Well, here at the Pima County Office of the Medical Examiner, uh, when a body or a skeleton or even a single bone is brought into the office, we do a post-mortem examination. That might be as simple as just observing the body and looking for any signs of trauma. It might be a full autopsy. And in the case of skeletons and bones that can't be autopsied by our pathologists, uh, those, are, those cases are then turned over to an anthropologist, and we have two here. And one of us uh, analyzes those bones and, and tries to determine some very basic things, male versus female, the approximate age, uh, the approximate height of the person. And most of these bodies and bones are found south and west of Tucson in the remote deserts, uh, the Tohoto Odom Reservation and the Sonoran Desert in southern Arizona. Ultimately, our goal is to identify this person. So if there's a missing persons report and we know that individual had some broken ribs on the left, maybe a broken nose in life, then we can take that information and compare it to a family reference and, and do a, a DNA analysis. So the desert itself is very harsh with the environment. The sun uh, will first bleach bone, but then it will actually kind of damage the bone. Um, and that can be a little bit challenging. Also, unfortunately, in the desert, there are a lot of animals that may um, scavenge parts of the skeleton and take parts away from from the skeletal remains, so we might only find a femur or we might only find a crania. Um, so that would be really challenging then. I think of it as a 206 piece puzzle. And the fewer pieces you have, a little bit of the picture that you can see. So of course, if we have more of the skeleton, it's hopefully um, a bit easier for us to identify that individual. So there's about a thousand charts. We call these charts. There's about 1,000. This is each chart represents one person who's currently unidentified. Now we think about 900 of these are gonna be Mexicans or Central Americans. wall is, you know, a great idea, but you build a uh, five meter high fence, they sell a six meter ladder. So 
you have to and you have to have people watching the fence In the Tucson sector, Border Patrol apprehends on the average for the past five years, 10,000 a month. And by Border Patrol's own numbers, they only catch 30%. So there's 30,000 a month getting by. And that's dope mules and who, who knows who else. Because, like I say, I got pictures of really really dark skinned people coming across and uh, so at a billion dollars a month how come you can't secure the border I mean I could do it I could do it for a lot less but I'm not in the government so nobody wants to listen or talk to me so they're doing it going in around and in between that cut, there's another trail that drops in just above us. We might walk up there and see if there's another water drop. It was about 2010 after the collapse and I lost my house and lost my job and everything else. I go, well, I guess that's a, uh, a sign that I'm freed up now. Go do it. So I cashed out my pensions and... Uh, sold what I could and packed it up and moved down here and I've been here ever since. And, uh, at first I was trying to just stop the illegal immigrants coming across. But the more I looked into what was going on, I saw how the cartels controlled the illegal immigration also, along with the dope trade. The humanitarians on this side, they accuse us of, uh, when we find the water drops of 20 gallons of water, of stabbing them and destroying the water and everything else. And it's like, why would we do that when in the summertime it gets to 120 degrees out and we're out in the desert, you can't carry enough water. So once you use your water, if you can look at your GPS and go, hey, there's water on the next side of the other side of this hill and you go over there and you go oh my that's right we chopped it up yesterday so no we use the water ourselves because it's humanitarian aid two four six eight ten twelve fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen eighteen nineteen twenty sixteen ooh nola bars that's a fresh resupply mm -hmm. there you go are you hungry yeah okay What else you got in there? The fucking beans? Come on. Beans are getting all the bars. Fifteen here. So we use the water drops as an intel source because basically the more you have, the more customers you know are coming through. So there's, there's no reason to chop it up. So, you know, that's the misconception of who we are, is that we're out here shooting people, and but all we're doing is we're stopping people. But if we come across them, we also provide them aid. Because a lot of the people we come across have been abandoned by coyotes out in the middle of nowhere. You're never going to make it. 
We'll see them after they've been walking for anywhere from two to seven days on their own. And they barely have any water, they don't have any water, and we give them water and medical aid and everything else. Uh, we've saved over 100 people just from dehydration and freezing to death. We'll find them in the wintertime when it's 20 degrees outside. And they have nothing except for the clothes on their back, and they're just, and you have to carry them back to the vehicles and you put the heater on and try to warm them up and wrap them in blankets and give them hot cocoa or hot coffee or anything else to till Border Patrol shows up. But so that's the misconception of who we are that regardless if you come in here the wrong way, we still don't want to see you die out here. So eventually, unfortunately, um, Tucson, the Pima County uh, Office of the Medical Examiner, we can't have uh, remains here indefinitely. So if we're unable to identify someone, they are eventually released to the public fiduciary who would then either bury or cremate that individual. So uh, the U.S.-Mexico border is, of course, an artificial border, like just about every border. It was established by conquest, okay, U.S. conquered half of Mexico. That gives you the border. Uh, that's been a very porous border throughout history. People go up and back pretty freely in both directions for all kinds of reasons. Uh, it was militarized in 1994 under Clinton's uh, Operation Gatekeeper. It was militarized in order to stop the movement of people across the border. That is to cut back international integration. Why in 1994? Well, because that was the year when NAFTA was initiated. That's why our administration has moved aggressively to secure our borders more, by hiring a record number of new border guards, by deporting twice as many criminal aliens as ever before, by cracking down on illegal hiring, by barring welfare benefits to illegal aliens, in the budget I will present to you, we will try to do more. So 96 is when the laws were enacted. It took a couple of years for enforcement to come to fruition. But by the year 2000, we noticed a five-fold increase in the number of, of dead migrants. And then it, it tripled after that. And it's, it's all related to U.S. changing policy of where Border Patrol is going to patrol. I think the immigration policy currently in the United States needs a lot of attention. Um, you know, I think it's unfortunate that individuals are risking their lives to come to the United States to work. Um, and I think if policy can be changed, you know, hopefully we don't have as many deaths through the Sonoran Desert area. Most of the dead, most of the people dying here are honest, law-abiding Mexicans and Central Americans who happen to die in Southern Arizona. 
they're on their way to do a job. They weren't on their way to break laws. They weren't on their way to hurt Americans. They weren't terrorists. They were here to do a job. So if we could fix immigration uh, legislation and let more of these people come over legally, I got to believe they would. What, what we're hearing repeatedly is, is the average Mexican pays maybe two or three thousand dollars to a smuggling group. And then that, that smuggler, that coyote, gets them across the border and, and on to somewhere else. Well, if people are willing to pay that to cross illegally, clandestinely, dangerously through the Sonoran Desert, I have to believe that those same people would pay that fee to the Mexican government or U.S. government to have a background check and then come in through an official port of entry and then get the proper paperwork so, A, they wouldn't have to live in fear of being deported and, and they wouldn't have to risk their lives uh, walking through the Sonoran Desert. So I don't even like to talk about a wall because it's just going to make things worse. What we need to be talking about is immigration reform and understanding that Mexicans and Central Americans are providing a necessary component to the U.S. economy. 